Hello everyone, today we talk about the imperial policy of Frederick I Barbarossa. Yesterday we were seeing what were the events uh, that brought to the rise of Frederick to the German mm, kingship. Uh, so he was seen as, as an urgent young ruler who descended from both from the, um, in fact, from the uh, Swabian and the uh, Welfen um, dynasties and so you know, the, also the political compaction of Germany at that point with the um, dynastic union of Saxony and, and Bavaria under his cousin Henry the Lion and his own, you know, uh, let's say, a, um, area of, of the sphere of influence on the other side, Swabia and Franconia, seem to be a very promising um, precondition, in fact, for a consolidation of a broader uh, Germanic interest, right, the resuming of, uh, say, uh, first of all, the pacification of Germany that from 25 years, let's say, or, or more actually, since since the, the, the struggle, let's say, for the investors had began, 80 years, had been in turmoil, right? And so uh, the Germans had suffered this humiliation of the Second Crusade that were blamed for together with, with the French, however, that could say, you know, we're just kings, you are the emperors, or you're, you're supposed to be once. And so there was a, a very strong, um, you know, um, let's say, a revival of, of, of a sort of sense of, of broader international interest of, of the kingdom of Germany. There were the moral and material resources, right, historically in this tumultuous, um, say, phase of tumultuous growth of, of European, uh, in fact, uh, expansion that, uh, that was very evident, especially in countries like Germany, that were literally overflowing their own boundaries due to their demographic and um, economical strength uh, and that therefore brought also to the um, reinforcement um, um, let's say or, or properly the, the reintroduction of some more um, sound uh, stable political institutional systems that in Germany paradoxically uh, were feudalism uh, in itself in an within an, an elective monarchy but uh, that was still, you know, the the step to take uh, in order to blend further the, uh, the 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 historical ethnic duchies, more or less, where these areas that had remained, these are had left the the, 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 Ger the German kingdom disarticulated in these various um, regions, very often also separated. Still, at this point, Germany was quite quite wild, right? And still, this enormous. Uh, forests, um, you know, it was a great period of clearance, of, of bonification, of colonization, uh, and that had, in part, in fact, uh, obstacled the process of the creation, properly, of a German national monarchy. As we've seen, the German prince's interest was not the one of having a strong ruler um, in, in a, in a s um, for, for the sake of a centralistic direction, because they wanted to enjoy their own autonomies. There were important differences, for example, in German feudalism differently from French feudalism, as um, like in England, for example, every vassal was to swear uh, fealty, essentially, to, uh, to all his superiors, up to the king. In Germany, instead, it was just, you know, their immediate um, superior, right? So um, this, this tells you how much the thing worked, um, say, from, from the bottom up, rather than the other way around. This was due to the fact to the less, lesser degree of settlization and and concentration of power, of course. And so, um, whoever came to, uh, you know, whoever rose to the German throne, uh, even though coming exactly from the same background, of this uh, privatistic interest was using the, the public authority in office to try to, to centralize also at the benefit of, of its own of its own assets and so on, uh, we know th that all the great German dynasties were elected to the monarchy were uh, were you know succeeded in this because they they were endowed with very strong uh, private assets. Right, this had been the case for for, for, for the Ottonians uh, in, in Saxony, the, the Salians in, in Franconia, and, and the same Hohenstaufen in in, in Swabia. Uh, plus, naturally that what this entailed for a, a broader, you know, clienterly policy and uh, the, the interconnections and uh, this it itinerating court that was a bit still like the standard in, in the 12th century um, in, in a majority of European monarchies, etc. So, um, 
The first steps of Frederick, once he was elected, uh, had necessarily to deal with Germany first, right? So, uh, to stabilize uh, power, to eventually resume the, the imperial, hence Mediterranean Roman policy. So, Frederick showed to be wanting to, to, to be backed properly, by both by the lay and ecclesiastical uh, high nobility. Uh, this was a, a good move because naturally there was, uh, as we've seen, this broader sentiment and need for a pacification that in the previous, um, during the previous uh, reigns had been you know, more, more difficult. Um, and so co-opting the, the elites was a good way say, to, to share the cake and trying to do it, however, in a way that wouldn't alter too much the balance in, in favor of of the privates and so very often boosting um, properly the elite so there is, is a way paradoxically to yes to make somebody more powerful but at the same time to control to 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 in, in, in say true the, the the relation with the same to control wider areas right and so feudalism that Frederick imported from the most updated and, and, and developed models um, from France fundamentally uh, w was used exactly to confer this greater prerogatives uh, to, to the higher nobility and say so that they could control better the the um, the rest right the the lower vassals um, however this in fact in order to to, to make the public authority uh, maintain the public authority intact and functional was accompanied by a great firmness that Frederick showed um, uh, to essentially, in order to impose his will uh, along the major policy lines that he was uh, expressing in a considerable quantity of plenary sessions, the the diets, the, the German um, uh, Reichstag, um, and so these were moments in which Frederick showed all his temper and character. It was inflexibly harsh with. Uh, whoever uh, derogated his line, right, he uh, proceeded towards the unfaithful vassals with confiscations of, 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 of lands of thieves that he eventually, he would eventually uh, entrust to administrators of servile origins that had a great success, in fact, mostly under Frederick's reign, the ministerialists, we made videos about them, you know, um, it's essentially, these were the the German uh, were, were rising to be probably the, the, the majority of the German knights. Uh, that in in, uh, in in its in, in their national characteristics essentially were non freemen, right? The German knighthood here was rising essentially from from serfs, right? That, however, were still um, in, um, provided with um, uh, endowed with a chivalric dignity. Right, and that quite soon learned to live and to behave as great lords, even surpassing the the free nobility at some point. This instrument was quite important. It had been um, pioneered by the essentially the the, the, the the clergy in Germany more than else. Um, but it had literally boomed at this point, uh, after especially after the settlement of the the, the investiture controversy, as you know the the, the further privatization of the German market had occurred, and so um, fundamentally um, uh, making it uh, easier for the same uh, ecclesiastical vassals to behave literally as, as as landlords with their own military retinues, and you know, um, uh, using these individuals that since were were serfs could not inherit; they had didn't have the right to inherit the the fief that they were. Entrusted. Naturally, over time, given the same levels of privatization, as we're just saying, the ministerialists became even more powerful than the rest of the nobility. But it, this this was a was a tool to still check, right? To to put a, a wedge fundamentally between the, uh, the, the the especially the ecclesiastical lords and the the more relatively more rapacious um, lay nobility, right? And and so and this was. Um, initially in fact an ecclesiastical and imperial policy as well because in this phase of German history the church was consistently backing 
imperial policy exactly against the the ambitions of, of the lay uh, nobility. This would change in the 13th century when, in fact, uh, this broader project of national monarchy would, would, would collapse uh, in the country. But uh, the ministerialists are, are, are a very key figure because if you look at Frederick's armies, also all the, the expeditions that were launched in Italy, uh, they were quite consistent military enterprises. Well, most of the, the German troops were, in fact, composed of ministerialists and especially of, of, of ecclesiastical retinues in this sense. And the, for the rest, the ministerialists was abs were absolutely identical from a military point of view to any other knight. Right, that again, they, they would soon become essentially the most uh, numerically the, the most frequent type of, of, of knight, right, especially in southern Germany. And this was due also, in fact, to Swabian policy that used extens extensively these, these men from, from the top of, of its own, uh, you know, imperial authority at that point. So, to a bit like, you know in different ways the free cities w would occur right you know making somebody rise to, to a higher level than they would in order to by imperial granted so that they could obstacle the the expansion of those forces that were trying to start to usurp the, the public rights um, and these men were also uh, a force to be reckoned with properly as in, in, in lifestyle because you see they, they were serfs so they were um, they were seeking for this social promotion. Uh, originally, their life was quite uh, harsh because literally they were purchased. They could be, you know, uh, sent both uh, from from a place to another. They, they could essentially change their life at, at will of their lords, right? And so, however, they had a great ambition. They were military men, right? The ministerialists had been born historically in post-colonial times, even before, let's say, as a, as a generic personnel, but in this warlike and perennially um, uh, tumultuous Germany. Th there was a, a degree of militarization that has to be considered. And um, and therefore, we're talking of men that could really put, you know, that could be really used by imperial power to intimidate their own opponents because they were really great fighters and extremely violent and radically, you know, uh, merciless individuals. And they, they would gain a consistent power and capacity and ambition on their own. Uh, and, and this would naturally make the same ministerialists most faithful to the throne because they, they knew that, uh, that it's only to the favor of, 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 of the king that they, they arrived their prestige and power. Right? And so in, in a way that had been the same case for, 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 the, for, for the ecclesiastical lords that were initially less powerful than the lay ones. Um, and so in in, in, in other cases, the ministerialists were not chosen as feudatories, but also as still as simple administrators of, of lands that the sovereign had confiscated to build through them, let's say, a, a great um, property, like land assets directly depending on the crown, and in this sense, on the, on the dynasty. Naturally, as we've seen in, in the previous video, most of the... Uh, you know, of the of the Hohenstaufen lands were concentrated between the Alps, the Upper Rhine, uh, the Lake Constance. And that's more or less the area, and, uh, and so uh, these were of of great strategic interest, especially considering the international situation. They were rich cities; they controlled important um, trade routes. They were close to Italy. They were close to France. Uh, so. They, they, they were, uh, they, they were living their moment of glory under the Orange South, and definitely. And Frederick had, um, in fact, understood that without a territorial base, an economical base that would be strong enough to, to still oil, the, the gears of 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 the, of the pol German political institutional systems, he could have. Uh, no, could have not exercised a, 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 a true a true power of, of any sort, right? And so it was fundamental still to, to aggrandize his own house in order to to maintain a you know, central power capable of also intervening, launching these expeditions, taming 
rebellions, uh, punishing the, the criminals and so on. So the idea of pacification was really important. Right? It's part of the reason why um, you know, the Hohenstaufen propaganda in Germany had been so effective as well. Because really a country can, yes, can be, let's say, fueled by these centrifugal ambitions, but at the end of the day, these are going to be, even if they succeed, they're going to be substantiated by the some sort of concentration of power. And so at that point, nobody really likes chaos, anarchy, and instability. You want to, you know, to maintain things balanced and to also consolidate your power locally that you can do if you find an agreement with, with the other, you know, uh, power, f uh, let's say, uh, the other magnates of the land. And so also coming with a compromise in this sense with the emperor that, as we've seen, has still kind of an interest for you to, to be able to maintain some order on his behalf in, in the country altogether. So after having worked between 1152 and 1154 to the settling of the German affairs, Frederick uh, decided to, uh, to descend in Italy, which happened, in fact, in 1154, in order to seize uh, the crowns of King of Italy and of Roman Emperor that, interestingly enough, the, as you will see now, the same Frederick would, would actually start titling as probably the Holy Roman Emperor by papal approval because of his universalistic ambitions and the, you know, properly stressing, of course, the sacred nature of the empire in this broader imperial um, I ideology. So we have explained many times why this was the situation, let's say, for um, German uh, kings to properly acquire, as we've seen, first of all, the crown of kings of the Romans in the same Germany as a, you know, international recognition would be uh, emperor fundamentally. And so the Italian exp expedition w was, was aimed at securing this. It was just uh, a big deal. Uh, internationally speaking, because it literally meant, um, and this would be the most important fact part of Frederick um, Barbarossa's reign, as his nickname actually also explains in the, uh, the still that was Rothbard in, in German, but the fact that the, the Italians stuck to uh, it was quite quite eloquent, um, and and because it was simply the the essentially the the German revival of uh, you know the, the revival of German policy in f fundamentally in another country I, in a, in a broader attempt to revive universal power and to pursue a Mediterranean policy that was connected with with a crusade the re reunification of the at that point the, the, the schism the, the, the say the, the two the two churches and in this specific context it was something really new that perhaps we will see even better hopefully in many other videos but that that m must make us understand, even in order to to understand the the consequences, the outcome of this, uh, what it meant for Germany and Italy by the uh, mid 12th century to be to, to to witness the revival of an imperial power, because uh, the the previous generations had actually seen not just a decline of imperial authority. Uh, but also of a rise of other powers. It was true both in Germany, but especially in Italy, as you know, with the with the communes. And so this force that at the end of the day would uh, would would resist and take up arms and manage to essentially make the same imperial policy fail uh, in the region. Uh, and um, and that of course had an important amount of 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 of, uh, of consequences all over the international balance, right? Today, maybe we'll, we won't see this specifically, but as we were saying yesterday, there was a um, an enormous involvement of many other powers on, on, in, in this in these campaigns, whatever was happening, right? Uh, Italy, for example, was full of Byzantine agents who were sabotaging the German army throughout all the, this, this, these campaigns. Um, there was naturally a great, um, you know, interest in, 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 in the success of the in the say the outcome of, of these Italian campaigns for neighboring countries. Uh, a, a stronger Germany reflected itself on you know the, the extension of the Germany in countries like Poland, Bohemia, Hungary. The same French uh, would at this point were you know gradually 
and difficultly managing to consolidate a, a true national monarchy. And of course, they were, they were ambitious enough to, to see also in this German uh, affairs the, the, the contrast with the papacy, with Bohm, they, they also already had important contacts, like kind of a, a challenge to their, to their international prestige. Um, uh, um, a renewed imperial power was naturally looked upon with, with interest, but also with, you know, with some complications in, in, in the Ultramar state, right, that had to, you know, were all hoping for, of course, for a crusade that could essentially make them, you know, could, could strengthen them and so on. But um, the same involvement in the Ultramar states of an external force very often brought to their injection of other of other dynasties, of other political influences, was something that changed the world policy with, with everybody, with the Silesia and Armenia, uh, with the Seljuks, with the Sultanate of Rome, uh, with the same Byzantine Empire that, of course, was not happy at all to see, uh, you know, a, a strong Germanic power revived in Italy, in, in the Holy Land. That th those were areas where, where the Byzantines at this point had also resumed an important, um, a policy of important scale. There was the same Kingdom of Sicily that uh, arguably was the most important reason that brought to the first expedition of Frederick in Italy at the beginning, because as we've seen in, in the last video, the, um, the, uh, the, the Sicilian uh, dukes had proclaimed uh, themselves kings of Sicily, and given that Sicily was a papal fief, the popes didn't like this much, also because you know the, the Sicilian Normans were next door to Rome, and so paradoxically, you know, uh, th there, there were lots of swings depending on, on all these in extremely complicated international balance that we can't reconstruct just in this video but that brought Frederick to the scent to Italy to, to actually wage um, a campaign against Sicily, that was the first thing but in the meanwhile other things had occurred I mean, the Roman commune had literally expelled the Pope out of, of, out of Rome um, the, the movement was taking quite disturbing traits with due to the preaching of certain heterodox, if not properly heretical, um, agitators such as the, the monk Arnold of, of Brescia was was by the way a um, a disciple of Abelard. Um, there was also arguably uh, the most importantly the uh, uh, properly the Italic kingdom issues with the with the expansions um, of of uh, the expansion of of the of the communes, and especially one of Milan that at that point was the largest city in Europe was starting literally to 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 bully the neighbors and trying to incorporate their own their own districts w under its own domination. So same the same Italian communes had asked the emperor to intervene because technically that was the higher authority to, to whom they they could hope to appeal. Right, and many many Italian communes were actually very glad at the beginning that Frederick had descended in Italy because they believed that, that he could negotiate easily uh, not just put an end to this dangerous situation for them and also negotiate relatively easily th their autonomies right so um, the fact that Germany and Italy had been so distanced importantly since the times of, of the ambassador controversy uh, had naturally brought also to a, to a cultural um, uh, distancing uh, as well Right, Frederick was at this point resuming a, um, you know, uh, essentially uh, the, the the dream of a, of, of an absolute uh, universal power, right? Something that, in in um, even in strictly juridical terms, had never been actually enacted in the West. All the other emperors had fundamentally uh, asserted their power. Historically, also the Ottonians that had managed to that they were the ones that had secured Italy and managed to rule in there. Uh, for a while, to um, let's say to, to feudal, on the basis of feudal law, right? And so also the autonomies that these um, communities could boast locally were fundamentally, uh, you know, not really depending on some sort of absolute, um, uh, let's say, will, but they were rooted in this uh, ancient concessions and so on. But it was the same Italians in in Bologna, especially, that had resumed the. Uh, the, the, the in fact the, the Roman law properly meant that by this point in the Middle Ages we're talking about Justinian's Corpus Juris Civilis that was bringing uh, say w was this was being done for eminently practical reasons there was nothing strictly ideological behind that but it had been naturally weaponized during the investitor struggles for the 
for the emperors to stress what, what was essentially the Caesar Papistic Byzantine uh, style of monarchy or rule where the church was absolutely you know uh, uh, submitted to the emperor that could decide to do whatever it wanted that so uh, where in the Roman state the, the imperial uh, the you know the, the, the imperial power was the only one that dictated was with the source of law right something extremely different from how it had been you know the case in development of Latin Germanic Europe in, in terms of uh, juridical customs at this point. So, indeed, Frederick was endowed with a, with a remarkable strength and determination and, and energy, and it was one of the most, uh, you know, active and, and um, passionate, you can argue, rulers at this point. But at the same time, if you look at the first campaigns, you realize, especially in Italy, you realize that he was he had something in mind that was incredibly discounting what the the actual mm, local reality was right and so uh, at the end of the day there was this enormous effort that on the longer run in spite of uh, a striking series of of, of 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 military activity of distractions sieges i mean s something extremely costly at the end of the day was 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 thwarted what was what uh, was was doomed what, what, what failed and uh and that brought in this sense also to say in Germany, important important consequences, not maybe so decisive at that point, was mostly the, the misfortunes of the uh, Hohenstaufen bloodline in, in, in terms of literally of biological uh, accidents that, that brought to the, to, to, to the further instability that would make the, the German monarchy collapse already by the time of essentially Frederick II, that was the first one who said, okay, you know, let's just okay, let, let's just buy our own our own public rights from the princes and let's fundamentally just behave like them let's not even attempt to do anything anymore because as we've explained many times also the, the point there was not at the time Frederick the second of course the the Orange had become masters of Sicily so that was a completely standpoint from which the Swabian sovereign was thinking at the, at the point of Frederick it was just really a very different thing it was literally about a, a german power that was to 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 subjugate uh, the italic kingdom from which it was hoped at that point to control the papacy to revive the mediterranean uh, strategy and so on and that however had not taken into account the 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 enormous and, uh, and in almost incredible moral and material resources of the italian communes right but it was still a feasible thing, at least in, in line of principle, right? Um, Frederick uh, did his duty. In 1155, he first entered Rome, where on, on behalf of the papacy, in request of the papacy, he repressed the free commune that had been formed there and um, essentially handed over the, uh, to, to the Pope the animator, the monk Arnold of Brescia, that was burnt at the stake. Actually, Frederick's line was to, to consider him as a traitor and as a rebel of the empire, whereas he he, he didn't he didn't deem you know he didn't interfere with the religious side. He didn't call it an erratic whatever. Let the thing being done by, by the Pope. The relations with the Pope were not really great, right? It was already even just in the in the first meeting this ambiguity for which the the Pope demanded the the German at the King of the Romans, this, you know, this act of, you know, you know, su submission formally to the Church, and uh, the Emperor refused initially, and the Pope didn't give him the, the keys of peace, and then eventually, um, you know, there was an agreement, but, you know, when, you know, Frederick was to make an homage to, the, the homage, the formal homage to the Pope, he said, not for, for, for Hadrian, uh, as the, was the the Pope at the time, but for Peter, right, to stress it was about the institution, it was not about the man. And so already this inherent um, um, rivalry that was, 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 as you know, the, the investiture controversy had been settled by, by separating once again the, 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 the this sharing these prerogatives for, for the Pope and the Emperor respectively in Italy and in Germany, We're talking about the bishops, investitures. So this had been settled with Worms in 1122. Now, 
the emperor came back the, and and so the situation was in theory I mean, there were, uh, you know, there were many other international problems, as we've seen, that would bring him into Italy. But still, you know, people remembered, right? There, there was in in, in Germany an, an anti-papal sentiment that had been also fueled by, uh, you know, certain, um, uh, of course, the same papal interference at times in German affairs. Given, for example, look at the, the time of Lothar of Sapplenburg, that, you know, as a weak uh, ruler began to, to strengthen himself by making concessions to the to the papacy in Italy by handing over some imperial fiefs, right, that at least fiefs that had been contested always, you know, in settle, unsettled matter between the papacy and the empire. So Frederick definitely embodied the uh the the figure of a of an absolute ruler that wanted to reinforce imperial authority as the sole source of law, the, the sole temporal um authority in, in Christendom and and therefore it, it's very important to observe what he did especially with the Italian communes because he um, summoned uh, two diets respectively in 1154 in Roncaglia and in 1158 in Piacenza um, in that were essentially aimed at not just r restoring, in fact, the, the imperial rights, but also at uh, enforcing the uh, properly Roman law. And so this new model of, of, uh, of, of, of rule, right, that uh, was essentially surpassing the old feudal customs and enforcing now kind of an absolute power in the land. So in, in uh, Piacenza especially, Frederick emanated this, the, the so-called Constitutio de Regalibus, so essentially a, a constitution about the reg regalia, the, the, the royal rights, the regalia jura, right? Um, that in which he sanctioned which one these were, uh, so what, 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 which ones were owed to the sovereign in the vest of king of Italy in that case, um, and that the communes had usurped. Right, and such rights that consisted essentially in the, uh, you know, in enjoying the exactions of taxes and tolls, and also the, you know, the ones, for example, on, on the bridges, on the roads, on the mills, and rights such as the ones of holding tribunals and minting money. Right, the, the emperor really was decided to, to enter in possession of, right, thus ensuring the uh, economical uh, income coming from 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 the, the same so as we were saying the f the juridical foundations for these claims didn't come from the feudal law right it was the jurists of the young but still important university of bologna that saint frederick uh, rewarded by posing itself under its own protection with the constitutio habita that provided these jurists with with a the, the university proper with a with an autonomy that escaped properly also, also the one of the the same Bolognese commune for example and another uh, you know any other authority could interfere there that, that would provide him essentially drawing as we have seen from from uh, you know from from Roman law um, the, the the same prerogatives according to Justinian's codification um, and so this this policy also boosted the the coming back of Roman law in, in the West, where it had been fundamentally forgotten, but that was instead still very al alive in Constantinople, and that has made um, back it, 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 it say its comeback in, in Europe. And in, in, in the name of, of the same, Frederick presented himself as, a, as an absolute sovereign, not subject to the laws, but on the contrary, as in himself a uh, source of law, which was a clamorous statement because nobody had ever thought this was the case. Like all Europe at this point worked on a very simple principle that rulers were such only if they, they could um, essentially preserve the pre-existing rights of, of, of the communities, right? It's essentially the common law. 
right? It's, it's still what exists as a foundational principle of the common law. So that's not that there is a state that becomes the source of law, like in civil law. And in fact, in Roman law and, and essentially in the states of, of um, Napoleonic tradition, that were essentially the completion of this gradual um, uh, alienation of, of uh, rights from the communities throughout all the, the ancien regime, par paradoxically with, through the process of modernization. Um, and, and therefore, this was a shocking idea, it was a revolutionary idea, it was something like essentially disregarding any kind of custom that had ever established within the Holy Roman Empire itself, by the way, that had been the sense also that, you know, in Italy, banally, that, that the constitutions of the, the various emperors from, from Charlemagne to, to, to the last Franconian ones had been had been there. They were part of, of jurisprudence, right? Uh, the Roman law had been um, revived in, in Italy, not because the, 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 the local jurists had, you know, thought, ah, we have to restore Roman law and system. No, they were essentially looking at it because they had a, actually a very complex and very still functional um, juridical system. We also made a video about this that was the sum of the various constitutions since the times of the Germanic rulers. It was a Longobard law, uh, even some Ostrogothic one or even some Visigothic loans at some point. Uh, the, the Frankish one, all these imperial constitutions, the various, uh, you know, the, the, the various capitulars, etc. Uh, and plus local customs at the same time. So wherever they found uh, a gap, right, some, you know, some case that could not be disciplined, um, which was increasingly happening given the, 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 the skyrocketing uh, socio-economical development of the region, um, you know, they would draw from yet another source of law that was being reconstructed philologically in the vest of properly of the Roman one, the Corpus Juris Civilis that had stopped circulating in the area for, 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 from centuries uh, and that probably had also never been, there is a huge debate about this among uh, uh, say his historians of law but you know had hardly even ever circulated in Italy itself you know because it was eventually take, almost completely taken over by, by the Longobards, especially in this area that formed, in fact, the same Italic kingdom that was the same continuation of it. Um, and so, uh, thinking it from, from the standpoint of that time, it was, it was an enormous, an enormous change and request, and uh, the, the whole thing was naturally aimed at um, essentially squeezing every kind of income from these local communities, which was kind of obvious, because the, the Italian city-states were mm, incredibly rich and given that they were so well scattered in this way they they, they were you know seen as, as an easy prey individually and they were objectively imperial vassals so it, everything was, was seen as normally there are very uh, Frederick worked quite intensely at, at many points to reorganize properly the, the imperial administration. So we have properly all the list of, of these communities from across Germany and, and Italy and even part of, of course, of Burgundy um, and so on. But these centers in the Po Valley especially were definitely the most important, the most striving, the ones that mm, deeply impressed the Germans when they descended in the peninsula because they they lived in a completely different way from their own. Um, Banally, uh, since uh, since ever fundamentally, the average German was a servant, right? The, in Germany, the, the 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 nobility had fundamentally taken over everything. It was everybody was somebody else's person, in a way. It was a a, a widely rural area. Um, you know, it was all fundamentally ruled by feudal lordships. Italy instead had its inhabitants traditionally as freemen, right? Feudalism had always been less uh, strong. Um, uh, the country had the uninterruptedly from from Roman times the the highest per capita wealth. Um, the uh, the cities had began to essentially to to take over the 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 say take control of the what had been the the local. Uh, government prerogatives that had been handed, for example, to, to the bishops in, in the vest of counts since Ottonian times. And so 
the communes were, were cunning in the sense because they were operating in, on behalf still of a constituted authority, but still taking matters in their own hands. They had managed to expand in the countryside, which is another thing that, uh, you know, it, it didn't exist anywhere else in Europe, meaning that in, in, in the other, uh, you know, of course this was the most intensely urbanized area, but there were cities and important ones elsewhere, but n none of them basically extended its own, I its control, sometimes even the city walls, right, it was properly not really a territorial domination of, of, of a, ci of a ci citizenry that would not contrast outside the city with, with I don't know, the land of a bishop uh, or, or, or a layman, or a lay nobleman. Not only the Italians were doing this, but the communes, so actually self-constituted political uh, bodies that were also traditionally not being ruled by the, the, the traditional feudal lineages that had been present on, on, uh, in, in the land, on the contrary, were expanding in countryside and subjugating the same nobility which from a German perspective was something like the world up completely upside down and the reason why they could do this was that they were dramatically powerful they had uh, really they were building re real states with an administration with literate people this was the, the most literate literate place in Europe at the same time when when the, the Barbarossa's ad, ad counselors, advisors came to this land, they began to say, look, we, we should start doing here what the Italians do. We should educate people. Uh, we should start create some personnel who is skilled, who is, who is, who is literate, who is, who is educated, who is capable, you know, because that would have been dramatically, a, as a startled model, of course, what, 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 what the, the emperors, ever since Charlemagne's time, that in fact attributed a, a clamorous... Um, importance to the Italian kingdom already at the time, which under the Longobards, as a few people know, actually enjoyed a dramatic civil development and was the most effect efficient and, and civilly advanced country in Europe already at that time, uh, was needed to centralize. Well, north of the Alps, there was no such a thing. It was all private power, right? And as, as a feudal one had constituted itself just on that base. So for the prerogative of a sovereign that wanted to centralize as a universal ruler, uh, these people, in fact, the the, the Bolognese, uh, the, you know, the the, the, the privileges uh, granted uh, to the Bolognese jurist proof was of vital uh, need, right? And and, and it, as it was vital in the sense to control the wall air because it, it was extremely rich, and and the the money, the resources drawn from there were definitely enough to to carry out an imperial policy, right? The only problem is that the way this was done was naturally conflicting with the interests of the of the Italian communes but secondly was also being done in a way that uh, started being observed as essentially beyond negotiable right it wasn't just like a real mediation it was like a, a foreign ruler who neither spoke of course Italian but not even Latin uh, and that you know simply styled himself as the Augustus as the Emperor whatever ever since he was in Germany, and came uh, there essentially dictating whatever had to be done or not to be done, and that all these incomes and, 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 and taxes and tolls that, that you know, the communes had also you know, began to, 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 yes, to absorb to public authority, but still making things work uh, in, in the absence of during, during the, the centuries, uh, we're saying, wait a second, why should we hand this to him, like, you know, we, we, because they were fine, absolutely, nobody thought that imperial authority was not to be there, on the contrary, as we've seen, the same was the same Italians who called, actually, for Frederick in that point, but, you know, they, they had not realized to which extent the emperor intended to, uh, to, to, to claim back these, these rights, that was essentially for their own entirety, which is not exactly, let's say, a way to find a peaceful settling on the matter. And, and Frederick knew better because he would have to descend six times in Italy, right, to try to fix things and eventually need bailing out because, you know, he was defeated. Um, so this, uh, you have to understand Frederick in the same way. It was not just, of course, a cultural a limit or, you know, misunderstanding or simply coming from a different world in, in a way. But it was also 
perhaps the only way um, uh, Germany could achieve that that universal uh, universal policy, right? And in fact, this was the time in the history which fundamentally the the German king during the Middle Ages, which the German kingdom was, was the the greatest power in Europe, right? The power achieved by Frederick throughout his own campaign, his own you know conquests and you know pacifications and so on, what brought the Holy Roman Empire to be the largest power in Europe, right, and, and, and consequently also extending, importantly, its influence over other areas and interfering with the entirety of, of Europe, the Mediterranean, the, the Near East, etc. And there would have not been another way to carry out this policy but through such dramatic energy, right? The emperor was was uh, was meant to to rule to to curb any resistance to demonstrate his power and it, it would have he would have never been able to even to an attempt a to 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 achieve a, a goal like that uh, without show displaying this power and effectively countering whoever went against him we've seen he had done it in germany he wanted to to do the same uh, in italy and so the the idea was, of course, the last great uh, effort of universalistic ambition. You can argue, even if, uh, you know, from a strictly ideological point of view, and even maybe in in in, in long term, you know, s success, you know, achievement, in also in a settled direction, 13th century France, kind of, can be seen historically. Uh, you you can argue that you know, I it's uh, only under the Hohenstaufen epopee that this could. Lit literally take back kind of a truly universal um, character all over all over Europe or at least to consolidate the Germanic Empire as the the greatest European power because in theory this was about restoring the Roman Empire um, that had never been over under the juridical point of view we made videos about this uh, explaining especially there's a video about 12th century Germany we made this this um, uh, this summer that explains how you know what what were the still the ambiguous but still consistent prerogatives from which the 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 empire and, and its romanity was was standing in West that are actually much less uh, filmsy like kind of you know fantasy like than most people actually believe. I'm personally dramatically sympathetic towards the fact that that the Holy Roman Empire had absolutely a full you know. Uh, you know, it was was perfectly um, legitimate as not just an imperial, but also as a Roman power, um, which the Byzantine legalistic, um, let's say, interpretation of the thing is was was kind of um, opposing. But on even in their own basis, it were very debatable, right? The the Hohenstaufen here were resuming, if you want, even a closer idea of what it was in the back in the day in, in the Roman mil military religion the, the, the idea of the imperium strictly meant right and and this enormous force that the country displayed at this point to the resources in, invested to try to curb even a you know fundamentally a more developed one in its own was 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 astonishing right there is really a, 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 a the, the same Frederick embodied it from a moral point of view a, an enormous strength right a, a real sense you know character of, of you know a military character of, 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 of German culture at this point, considering that this was recognized internationally speaking, that, that the Germans were kind of more warlike, they were still more almost, uh, you know, imbued of the ancient uh, furor, these, these things that their youth was, you know, spreading, there was a demographic strain. It, it, it's not very different from even the, 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 what we call the barbarian invasions, right? These things didn't end like with, you know, with late antiquity, early middle ages, you, you can see in this phenomena even in, in later times, even in the modern age, uh, as still going on, because they really responded to those things. Germany was surely wilder, less pacified, more open to the East, in this sense, way more, you know, mm, kind of uh, militarized in many ways. And so, uh, under Frederick de Ries, this uh, even injection of that element in the South that was richer, more florid, but let's say more 
more civil, more urban, more, you know, more gentrified, I I I if you want. But still, at this point, of course, as the Lombard League proved that, you know, that there was a pretty consistent um, s uh, spirit of and, and capacity of resistance in those communities as well. Um, and so it, it goes without saying that uh, this, even just the claim that after 7th century, an actual Roman Empire had to come back in the form properly, even of its own ancient law, which not the Carolingians or the Ottonians had not resumed. Frederick did for the first time. It would be, if you want, always the the, the hallmark of, 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 of the Orangestaufen and their legacy later on. Uh, what procured uh, Frederick, of course, many enemies. Because um, against him, basically, all the uh, northern and central Italian communes sided. Right, this uh, happened uh, because, of course, as we've seen in the long decades of the vacancy of, of royal power, that is essentially fr from the time of, of the death of, of Henry the, V onwards, um, had led a, a real policy of, usur of usurpation of those royal rights towards the, the, uh, the smaller cities, the neighboring feudatories, right? This was the, 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 the main thing, right, that, 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 that like, a, a German king could, could not conceive, I mean, the idea that a commoner could, could dictate law to a nobleman. You understand how deep this thing is? It, 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 you, you gotta, it, it was inconceivable. So, you understand where the cultural difference there is? Is it's not that they wouldn't understand each other, but they they, they would re refuse that, right? Because it it wasn't compatible with 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 both with uh with what both systems had to leave off, right? Of course, there was a middle ground where you know an agreement could be found, but on on this ideological basis, it, that could not really be found. Um, and so as we know, the most um powerful of of these communes was Milan that um, after all because of its uh, policy had uh, uh, gotten herself many enemies such as the uh, Lombard cities of Cremona, Como and Lodi that essentially were bullied constantly by Milan uh, because their markets were florid, the Milanese wanted to control them right? and so they started interfering in, the, 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 in their own districts and so immediately sided, right, these enemies immediately sided with the emperor. Initially, again, all these cities that eventually would actually, seeing what imperial policy consisted of concretely, would e eventually end up to fight against Barbarossa in their own way. Initially, they turned to him, even when he was uh, north of the Alps. I mean, the Italian vassals normally, you know, uh, sent their, you know, their, their representatives in, in Germany to ask emperor would be that the were uh, the emperor that was always interested about what was going on in the peninsula because it was its primary interest to to see whether there was any option to to intervene whether the the communities were kind of supported that this could open the path to a, an invasion uh dealing with the papacy or seizing sicily and things like these um and they turned to the emperor to ask uh him to stop milan and its expansionistic policy. But Frederick, in the meanwhile, had gained also the enmity of the new pope, that was the, the canonist, uh, Rolando Bandinelli. So we're talking about one of the persons who were some of the fiercest uh, defenders of the uh, papal prerogatives in a, in a monarchic sense, right? So in a, a jurist, so those, because in, in, in parallel to to the, 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 say, the, the civil law, we, we could say, uh, of, of, of the Bolognese school that was restoring great importance to, to public, say, to lay authority, um, has been seen many times. The, the papacy had developed for the administration of the church for this enormous project. It was, you know, substantiating even more, created a, literally a, a canon law, right? So uh, an ecclesiastical law in parallel, Right, and they obviously were interconnected because very often 
uh, in order to to develop it the, the same the, individually did these two uh, laws were to to study each other right because I- independently from the political competition still these this 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 uh, juridical production was of enormous civilizational um, uh, importance right it, it, it was something you know incredibly practical effective needed literally to make states work like the ones that were being built locally um, and so uh, Bandinelli had risen to the papal soil with, with the name of Alexander III and who intended in fact to carry out the hierarchic uh, policy of Gregory the Seventh. Also at this point uh, Frederick's opponent was the Byzantine Emperor Manuel Comnenus who aimed at the affirmation of Byzantine authority also in the West, right, especially in the Adriatic area of the Italic Peninsula. You know that Manuel would essentially launch uh, a full-scale invasion of southern Italy, almost uh, wiping out the Sicilo Norman Kingdom. Eventually, was defeated, but um, this was a moment in which still the the Church of Rome itself was it was the last moment in which kind of was still open more to you know falling in the orbit of of a Byzantine, I'd say mostly of reconciling with the Byzantine church uh, in exchange for this eventually sharing of the kingdom of Sicily because that, that's how it would have happened uh, practically after the Byzantine conquest, like a dec- very decentralized situation, but you know, with, with a pope uh, uh, managing to, to expand dramatically from a territorial point of view southwards. Um, and so in this first expeditions, um, Pope and Byzantine Emperor proposed immediately to, um, uh, to, to to sustain the Italian communes that intended to contend Frederick the right to the regalia and the head of which was Milan. Right, so this is how the, the broader um, factions were mm, preparing for war because the, the 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 you know the operations immediately began quite consistently there, there was like a great byzantine interference also the, the the occupation of ancona for example that frederick besieged the this these campaigns were terrifying really the first experience of frederick in italy was was horrifying it was basically blockaded uh, it, it met resistance everywhere um and it, it, the situation immediately escalated in a military sense he destroyed Tortona for example uh, he he reached Rome and had to basically to give up right, aside from you know obtaining the crown to control the city he went up to Ancona and besieged the sentry was even there uh, a disaster because by the way um, it was said that uh, Byzantine agents were everywhere they were poisoning the German supplies um, this the this play er, every Every place had, you know, when even when Frederick had to come back to Germany, the the, the, the Venetian uh, communes blockaded his, his his way back. He had to to break through. It was, it was a a mess, right? And so it was a terrifying experience. It was never a moment of rest. And um, so, at this point, Frederick had understood immediately the danger of the enemy front that was being constituted, and he had. In fact, even tried to to prevent the election, the papal election of Alexander the um, Third, and um, and and this brought to the creation, in fact, of an anti-pope because the the prelates that were uh, leashed, let's say, to imperial power had reacted by electing another another pope right against the the, the papal one, and and this uh, uh, schism, however, didn't you know, didn't help the emperor at all internationally. Um, because first of all, it required great energies to be maintained in the first place. It didn't serve to provide a greater prestige to the German sovereign. He tried at some point also to, to call a council uh, with, together with the king of France to secure, to, to, to debate the, on le- the legitimacy um, of, of, his own, uh, of, of his own creation of the anti-pope. 
but the king of France, when he, he was about to join, he learned that Frederick had sto uh, stacked the, the, the votes for, for the antipope. He, he left because he didn't want to, to have anything to do with that. So it was immediately... Uh, the, the, the whole thing started with the wrong foot, right? If there was any way to, to secure a stronger position, it was not by essentially stepping in this reality, immediately dictating whatever had... To, to be done, trying to, to take away of, of all the resources, uh, imposing, you know, will on, on the Pope, and when when not reaching that, creating an antipope, it was was really an extremely uh, impacting and and you know and and breaking and uh, disruptive situation, right? And so this this eventually brought to the uh, the continuation of these expeditions that, as you as you know, would as you will see better in another video, would bring even to the destruction of Milan that the Milanese rebuilt from scratch in some years and kept le leading the, the struggle. That tells you how, how uh, resourceful these, these centers were. And all the various battles culminating eventually with the 1176 one of Legnano that brought properly to, to, to the fate of any further attempt to bring down these powers with force. But it, it was an exhausting experience. At, at the end of this period, Frederick, that was a, a, a very energetic person, was an exhausted man, right? And, and this, uh, it was a continuous uh, operation. And uh, and it's important to, to to also measure, actually, it was not completely continuous. I mean, at some point for six years, Frederick remained in, in Germany, that in the meanwhile, naturally, was in turmoil, because you can't imagine what, what happened in the meanwhile. Like, uh, the, the situation was getting very bad for him, so he had already achieved an important power, the German princes didn't like all of that, so they began to revolt again. The excommunication provided them with, uh, with even the, the formal excuse for doing it, so it was a whole freaking mess, because wherever you stepped you would cause a reaction, and this thing had essentially radicalized, extremized in a way it never been seen before, but it was still part of this broader uh, lucid like kind of clear mm, uh, rational intent to to represent essentially an absolute Roman imperial power in the West right and Frederick is objectively the um, the, the, uh, the the Roman Emperor let's say the in fact properly so probably the, the, the Germanic Emperor went the closest to achieve this historically right and this is the the value of, of, of the man of the character um, and still in a phase where universalism was we're talking about the 12th century right so this is still a a primitive primitive time right the the secularization has still not yet kicked in in the way it would happen paradoxically in fact in the following century was supposed to be the peak of universalism and it was still a world dominated by forces could really be seen as um, capable of extending in virtue of their their um, of this their sacredness and God given power a control on, on the world entire right and so uh, even if you study this period you realize how close they went to achieve that right how I don't know, a, a, a German Ghibelline victory at Legnano could have really changed a lot of things in, in, in Western history. Um, maybe not making, even in there, the Germanic Empire lasting as a you know, sovereign power or, or over, over Europe, things like these, but still radically altering um, the world. Like, even the most minimal, minimal accidents can do. You can imagine consequences like that one in the entire history of the world um, but we will see better these clashes and in part also reconciliation at the end of Frederick's reign unavoidably so and you you got to give even the men this this uh, this exit this wisdom right and if you know even his unluck in dying in the crusade but still having it 68 years old after all that Fort the strength to pick up arms and to to at this point do it um, in the name right of, of of the struggle for the recovery of the Holy Land and engaging at that age and with all those risks where in fact you know he lost his life in such an enterprise gives you really the idea of 
much of a fighter, much of a warrior this, this individual was, right? But for today, we stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time.